the new birdie is a bit of a tuning. Yeah, uh, I mean, which you can easily do by folding it, actually, if you're not careful. The birdie design is not good like that. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to open our number seven Provost Lecture Series, and also our first lecture, uh, first lecture for FY 2023. And uh, so uh, today, so we are going to celebrate um, Izumi's well-deserved uh, promotion to tenure. And uh, 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 so get, uh, getting tenure, usually you have to demonstrate significant uh, scholarship and uh, mentoring and also service, you know, many different components. And uh, um, so today, Professor Simone uh, Pigalotti is going to chair the session. Um, for those of you who are here the first time, I just want to just highlight uh, the Provost Lecture Series that we started last November. And uh, so it has been um, going strong. As you can see, these are all the, the, the six past uh, uh, Provost um, Lecture Series uh, professors. And uh, so also the, the Provost Lecture Series, um, so, took, uh, so we uh, took a lot of effort and time and energy from people from different divisions within OIST. So we would like to thank them, especially people from the Provost Office and also people from the CPR. And uh, so now today, uh, so this is Izumi's talk. I, w I also want to alert you that we have um, about 10 lectures tentatively planned for this fiscal year. So we're still trying to sort out schedule because summer is going to be somewhat challenging. Many people are going to travel. Uh, so we have Christine, Ya Bing Chi, uh, both of them got um, uh, awards, so we also want to celebrate that. Um, uh, professor Sazi, who was recently promoted to full professor. And uh, after this May and uh, um, also later September's BOG meeting, so we're also expecting several other faculty members to be promoted with tenure. Um, so the list is uh, growing, but to currently we're projecting about uh, 10, lectures here, uh, 10 lectures within this fiscal year. Uh, so with that, I will hand uh, the microphone over to Simone. Okay. Uh, so she has an interesting life history. She was born in Tokyo, but then uh, she spent uh, her young years in Malaysia. And then she moved uh, to London for his uh, university studies, where she started uh, her uh, academic career at uh, University College London as a PhD student. Then she moved to the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg as a postdoc and then back to London uh, with a career development fellowship at the Crick's Institute. Uh, and then she came here to OIS where she did her tenure track as assistant professor and recently was promoted as a professor and that's why we are here today. So uh, let's talk about her work at OIS. So at OIS she founded the Sensory and Behavioral Neuroscience Unit uh, where she focuses on uh, studying uh, the olfactory system experimentally uh, using mouse as a, a model system. So this is a pretty complex system in biology because um, different odors from the environment have to be encoded in the brain via a complex pathway and this also depends also on, uh, for example, the context and environmental state. So I'm sure she will tell us all about this uh, in her uh, lecture. Uh, she's a very accomplished experimentalist. When she came here, she built a, a quite sophisticated lab to study the systems, combining a, a bunch of uh, uh, state-of-the-art experimental techniques, ranging from electrophysiology to optogenetics and more. Um, so I actually uh, liked reading uh, when I was preparing this introduction this very nice interview uh, to Izumi uh, that was uh, prepared by the uh, journal, prestigious journal eLife uh, in occasion of her first paper as PI. And here Izumi talks about her research, but also about um, the challenges of being a junior PI in her typical humble style. 
And uh, because uh, Izumi is so humble, I think sometimes it's uh, under-recognized how much she has been doing in these years for uh, OIST and our community. And I think she's really uh, the heart and soul of our university. And I'd like to mention a few uh, examples of this. One uh, maybe might sound a little bureaucratic, but it's in terms of uh, her uh, incredible dedication to um, academic service. So she did uh, really a lot during her tenure track. She was a member of the faculty council. She was a very active member of the strategic task force to discuss uh, future strategy of OIS. In particular, uh, she was really one of the proponents of this idea of uh, research tags and so on. Um, she was in charge of a, a target of opportunity faculty search, which was pretty uh, delicate and uh, sensible process. Uh, she was responsible of setting up uh, uh, the neuroscience core curriculum. You know that neuroscience is one of the largest uh, group at OIS and uh, making sure that everybody's on the same page for something like this is uh, really a, a non-trivial task. Uh, she was part of the presidential search that gave us our new next president. And there is a countless, uh, she gave countless contri constructive contributions to a large number of issues. I mean, this is really the ones I remember. So there are, I'm sure there are many more. So uh, I think this is pretty extraordinary for a person during uh, her tenure track. And uh, I think it witnessed the fact that uh, she's really dedicated not only to science, but also to the uh, benefit of our community. Uh, besides academic services, she did also many more things behind the scene. I'd like to mention uh, one project, which is uh, the Campus Wildlife Garden. So uh, she was uh, concerned by the fact that we are cutting a lot of trees and started uh, together with uh, Juanita Cho, a project to build a small plot of land close to the gardens with uh, saplings uh, of uh, local species and try to uh, grow up trees there. And in typical Izumi style, this was not only a matter of uh, obtaining a small grant and uh, uh, directing and leading this project, but also uh, working in first person and just not being worried of doing the hard work here. Um, and besides this, she also uh, has a lot of other talents that we learned to appreciate over the year. For example, she's an extremely skilled photographer. You might have noticed that uh, on TIDA, on the top right of the page, there's often uh, like an impressive uh, picture, often taken for campus. And uh, more often than not, these photos are from Izumi. Uh, these are almost all taken on campus by Izumi, except the Kuina, that it's uh, not on campus, but since it's a rare bird, <laughs> I thought it was nice to show it. Um, and she has a bunch of other hobbies that uh, we learned about during the years. Many of them we have um, witnessed. There's one that uh, I heard about, but I never witnessed. I hope that one day she will show us. She's apparently very good at riding the monocycle. And uh, because of her dedication, I received a lot of uh, 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 thoughts from previous executives at Toys that I'm going to read. So. Uh, Mary Collins, previous uh, provost, uh, wrote that Izumi is a great neuroscientist, seamstress, chef, photographer, and plants woman. So everybody is impressed by her multiple skills. I got also one from uh, Neil Calder, my pre previous uh, vice president for communication, who wrote, beyond her excellence in scientific research, Izumi has qualities that will perhaps be more important for her future career and indeed science itself. She laughs a lot, she's kind, she notices things around her, whether a reflection in a droplet of water or the tiniest insect on the tip of a leaf or the emotions of others. She's a musician, she's effortlessly bilingual. Her welcoming personality will draw people to OIST and indeed young people to science. She's the scientist of the future. So, and this is actually a movie. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, this is what I wanted to say. Congratulations, Izumi, on your achievement, oh. and I'll pass you the baton for your presentation. Please. 
Hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much, uh, all of you, for coming. Um, it's been really a pleasure working at OIST, building my career uh, with really warm support from everybody. Um, it's hard to follow that kind of introduction, but I'll try my best. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about uh, the sense of smell. And this is a modality that is often said to be an undervalued or underappreciated modality. Uh, because, you know, when you think about thriving in this modern society, um, you know, losing the sense of smell is really a lot less detrimental uh, than uh, losing a sense of, you know, um, the ability to see or um, uh, the ability um, to hear things. But if you think about how much time we spend, some of us, thinking about or even obsessing over some good sources of odors, uh, like fragrances and the flowers, uh, you know, um, or flavors, the sense of smell really still is very much part of our lives. It really is an important part of um, an enrichment um, uh, without which our lives would be quite a, a sad one. So, and um, now Simone has already shown this picture, but I wanted to introduce some of our local delights, which is actually uh, Madagascar jasmine. If you're um, after some uh, local um, uh, uh, sources of good odor, I would recommend you to stroll next month to Akama Sports Complex, which is just around the corner where uh, the Madagascar jasmine will be blooming. Um, and, you know, it's just a source of very um, fresh, floral, uh, distinct scent. That will be a memorable experience for you. Now, I wanted to mention jasmine um, because it would be a nice way to introduce what it is that we are uh, smelling. So this is a study by Ken Sakamori and Yoshi, or Yoshihara's work from 1994, where they managed to detect about 20, you know, different kinds of molecules that make up um, the sense of, you know, this jasmine scent. And one thing that, you know, is striking already from uh, this um, analysis is that one, even for one scent that makes up jasmine, there are many molecules that are involved. And indeed, you know, it's really difficult to realistically count how, just how many odors we are able to detect and discriminate between, right? So many, many volatile small um, compounds uh, we are able to detect, and that's a source of information, right? So, so that's one challenge that the olfactory system of the brain faces. Another aspect that's interesting uh, looking at this is that of all of these volatile compounds, somehow we can put the meaning to a selection of these. So, you know, um, for example, in this case, um, we somehow are able to detect this combination of 20 or so odd compounds and identify it as maybe a jasmine-like scent, right? So there is detection and also an, an analysis component to our sense of smell. So, so this is really fascinating, and this sort of mystery behind the chemical senses is one motivation for me uh, to be studying this scent. But also, as a neuroscientist, I find this quite an important system because for um, you know um, a model organism that has been used widely in neuroscience, um, like this, the mouse is a nocturnal mouse, so the sense of smell really is a, a great driver for uh, their behavior. So um, this may makes it sort of an ideal system to study the neurons and how they function and in their interactions also with each other and especially in the behavioral context. So these are the motivations for um, why I, I choose to uh, study the mouse olfactory system. So today, um, in this talk, I would like to brief, uh, sh briefly share with you uh, how Generally, um, at the superficial level, uh, the olfactory system of the mouse is organized so that when I come to uh, sharing why I, I came to be interested in this flexible smelling, uh, perhaps I can communicate it better. And then um, later on, I'd like to share with you some of um, uh, yeah, little discoveries, my journey so far um, in this quest. 
So let's start at the beginning. So um, the sense of smell really starts in the nose, which is not really a surprise, we know that. But so, and it starts at this structure called the nasal epithelium, which is located at the back of the nose in the nasal cavity. It's convoluted structure. Now, um, so if you were to then cut across this slightly bony structure, what you see is this convoluted structure and inside there is this lumen, and this is the airway, right? So the air, as animal breathes, the air passes through. And now, and, and this sort of cavity is lined with a sheet of cells. And if you were to zoom in, in this illustration from Linda Buck and Richard Axel's paper, and you can see there's a mixture of neurons. And in particular, neurons of um, interest today in particular are these, what we call bipolar neurons, so neurons with two poles. And, it, and, and these are the ones that are doing the hard work of converting molecules, detection of molecules, uh, into the electrical activities, which are uh, the languages that the brain can understand. So these uh, neurons, sensory neurons, extend this knob into this airway, and they have these hair-like structures called cilia, uh, and that's impregnated in this sticky fluid that you have in your nose, mucus, uh, which allows molecules to easily diffuse um, into the, um, the solution and ultimately into the membrane where the sensors or the receptors are located. And it was uh, Linda Buck and Richard Axel's work in 1991 that led to the discovery of these uh, receptors uh, for which they won the Nobel Prize. Um, and their insight was to identify this seven transmembrane protein, and that comprises a really a large family. Um, right, so this is key because you know we need somehow sensors to be able to detect and discriminate so many different right uh, molecules. So they were looking for, well, they they didn't know what they were looking. They knew that they were looking for something like this, but they were able to identify something that comprises a large family. And all of these black uh, dots indicate the amino acid residues that can be highly variable. And because of this pioneering, pioneering work that led to the identification, now we can look for something like this with similar sequences in our human uh, genome, for example, and identify, for example, there are about 400 functional olfactory receptor genes present in our genome, right? So, um, so that's quite a lot, except that, you know, olfact more, you know, superior uh, animals like mice have more than 1,000 different kind of genes to use, so that gives it um, better resolution for them to be uh, dealing with the chemical um, stimuli. Okay, so, so one thing that we take from this is that, yes, we have a lot of different types of receptors. Um, but in addition, you know, if, you, if one type of receptor was dedicated only to one type of molecule, then we quickly run into trouble, right? Because if the jasmine scent already has 20, then uh, right, um, it, it's not quite possible to represent so many different molecules. And the trick that um, the system uses is to instead use a combinatorial representation. So instead of one molecule representing one odorant, it's thought that these receptors are tuned to one bit, you know, a particular feature of a molecule. So this could be like a functional group or so. And uh, by using a combination um, of the receptors to represent an odorant, uh, you can imagine then the system is able to um, represent far more uh, types of molecules than is possible with a number of receptor types. So, because of these pioneering, pioneering works, we understand why it is that, uh, you know, we can detect um, and discriminate between so many molecules. Now, but as I have said already, the detection part is just a start, and there's a whole lot um, that goes on, which is to do with analysis, and this is something that, um, that occupies our mind quite a lot. 
And in, in particular, we study this structure called the olfactory bulb. So this is the first a relay station or the, the smell center, if you'd like, of, of the brain that is um, getting input directly from those olfactory sensory neurons in the nose. So I'd like to talk a little bit about organization here because I'll be uh, talking a lot about uh, this area. So how, how is the input to this region organized? Um, so in this image, um, you can see uh, from Peter Mombers and others' work, you can see the epithelium and in connection uh, with the olfactory bulb. And now what they have done is to stain for sensory neurons um, that are expressing a particular type of receptor called P2 receptor. And what you can see is that these neurons, right, um, are kind of scattered the same randomly in the epithelium, but as their input or output projects towards the olfactory valve, they somehow come together, they converge and, and terminate in this really tiny discrete spot. And this is called glomerula. So you can imagine then if you have 1, 000, more than 1,000 different types, you will have a surface map of these olfactory receptors. Uh, so that's quite a nice uh, spatial transformation. Incredible. Now let's go a little bit deeper into this structure. If you were to then make a cut here and stain for where the cells are located, what it reveals is a very beautiful three-layered structure. And, and this outer layer is where the olfactory sensory neuron terminates. And you can already see this sort of circular, if the lighting allows, I think, I hope you can see it, um, these circular structures, these are glomeruli. And as I have said, this is where the olfactory sensory neurons expressing the common receptor type converge. And this is where the olfactory information is then passed on to the neurons of the brain. And I have shown, uh, drawn a cartoon of this here, but in reality, uh, they look a lot more beautiful than that. Uh, so this type of cell is called mitral cell because the cell body looks like mitre, you know, the headgear worn by bishops. And, and then you can see this single thick uh, process that comes out and a tuft and this is the one that go, goes into this little circle so this is the input structure and there are some sideways structures and then that's the output so that can extend in millimeters and this is the, the cable that's um, you know transmitting the output um, into other parts of the brain so there is input and then there's output. So, you know, a reasonable question one can ask is then, you know, so is the output the same as the input? Well, you know, that would be kind of a useless thing, but you know, it's a reasonable question to ask. And I think it's an important question to ask because understanding how the signal is transformed here is like, you know, one way to understand how the brain analyzes chemical information. So this is the kind of question that I started to get um, interested in as a postdoc um, in Andreas Schaefer's lab. And to get to this, I um, conducted a lot of electrical recordings um, using um, a technique called whole cell patch clamp recordings um, in vivo. So the general technique of this patch clamp recording was pioneered by scientists um, Erwin Neher and Bert Sackman also for which um, they won a Nobel Prize. But in this whole cell mode, um, what you get is, you know, so you reach, so you have this glass capillary that makes this high uh, resistance seal. So it just the membrane sticks to this uh, glass and then you rupture the membrane and you can gain an electrical access to the inside of the cell. So what this allows you to do is to then measure the voltage across the membrane and so I try to see what's going on, you know, what kind of electrical signal that the cell is using. Um, so when you make a successful recording like this, um, in, in, the, in, in this case an anesthetized mouse, uh, what you get is something like this. So um, in vivo there is kind of an ongoing uh, fluctuation in the membrane potential. Uh, we call upward events um, excitatory events and uh, downward ones inhibitory events. 
And if the excitatory input is large enough, at one point it crosses a threshold, and you can see that, um, you know, it, it, it leads to a generation of this very characteristic large short events called action potentials. So these are the ones that are carried by this output structure that goes out of the brain. Now I'm showing this signal next to the chest distension signal. So this is the breathing signal, right? Um, because this slow oscillation that's ongoing happens in sync. Uh, with uh, you know the animal's breathing, and this happens really in the absence of odors as well. So why why should there be an ongoing um, slow oscillations, um, you know, when there is no odor? Well, it turns out that the, the bipolar neuron, the sensory neuron that I talked about already, they're also mechanosensing. So when there is no odor, they're kind of um, taking uh, information about airflow and sending subtle, you know, rhythmic information um, to the brain, uh, to the olfactory valve. And which is why, if you record from these neurons, you get what we call sniff locking, so rhythmic activity that oscillates in sync with breathing. And typically, if you um, study a given neuron, um, then the peak happens consistently in one part of the phase. And it happened that every time I recorded from these large deep um, types of mitral cells, and uh, the peak happened to be kind of um, at the end of the sniff cycle. And uh, curiously, if I record it from, um, you know, this smaller and superficially located neuron, suddenly what we saw was a peak that happened earlier in the sniff cycle. So this is curious because, you know, there's only one rhythm that's related to breathing, but somehow in the output, there is a bit of a phase shift, right? And it happened that these superficially located tufted cells are oscillating in sync with the input from the nose. So there is no phase shift for those neurons, and it's these deep ones that are phase shifted. So they're locking antiphasically uh, with respect to the input. Now, why am I mentioning this? Um, so this baseline phase shift uh, leads to kind of an interesting um, uh, consequence on how these neurons encode odors. And it's because, you know, so if you were to look at these neurons that oscillates in sync with um, the breathing, when there is an excitatory input coming in, when there is a favorite odor, then what happens is that these neurons generate more and more of these action potentials, the output, but without appreciable change in the timing. Yeah, so this neuron, these neurons tend to use a firing rate to encode the presence of odors. Whereas these deep neurons, because of this baseline shift, um, when you know to encode odors, there is some kind of um, rate code as well. But the the major thing that happens with this was a t change in the timing of um, action potential generation. So, so you know, so there is some kind of a divergence in the way that these neurons encode odors, right? So, and I mentioned this just, um, you know, uh, the way, an example of some kind of transformation going on. And it's important with this phase shift, for example, we think that it's representing different kind of um, information that's integrated by these neurons. So clearly, the output is a little bit different from the input. So why would we expect, or why, why should the output be different from the input in this structure? Well, uh, we know, well, there are many, many reasons, but one big contributor is the presence of these, what we call inhibitory interneurons. So these are neurons that don't project out of the structure, but they mainly connect with neurons inside this structure. Um, and, and these types are inhibitory because the, their input to these neurons drives membrane potential away from this threshold for action potential. Um, and it's important because um, in this structure, particularly in the factory bulb, 80% or so of the neurons are this inhibitory interneuron type. So there are many of, of you know, quite a large portion of the circuit are these inhibitory ones. And 
we think this is really important for the function of the olfactory bulb in the same way as you know subtraction and division are very important operations for any computations that you might carry out. So we think that they're important, but you might also uh, notice that these are contacting the input structure and these deeper uh, types of uh, interneurons are contacting the lower part, so the side um, dendrites or lateral dendrites of the mitral cells. So it suggests to us that perhaps they have different kind of um, functions when it comes to signal transformation. So this is the kind of thing that I asked as a postdoc, and uh, we had just just the right tool to be um, uh, using uh, to prove that um, you know whether these popula you know populations of interneurons are uh, contributing differently, and and that technique we used was optogenetics. Um, so this is a technique in particular where we can shine light and silence the neurons that express these opsins. So in other words, we can shine light and remove these inhibitory neurons from the equation. And then we can target this optogenetic silencing to these deeper classes of neurons versus those that are located more superficially. And what we found was that for the transformation that I talked about, um, the, you know, the, the mitral cell phase shift, it turns out that these superficial ones that are inhibiting at the, you know, where the input comes in, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, important. And actually for, for this paper, I looked at all sorts of uh, phenomena, you know, uh, odor responses, etc. And for all of the things that I looked at, these were providing really strong influence on, you know, the output. You know, you know po really potent um, effects on the firing rates. Uh, and if you think about it, it's quite uh, important because these are the ones that can potentially change the activity patterns that are going out of the olfactory bulb. Right. Uh, whereas these deeper ones were kind of, uh, you know, it contributed uh, in a really subtle way if you really looked closely. So, um, you know, but barely detectable. Now, this was a really a, a, a surprise for us. And why was this surprising for us? Is because if you look at this section again, you know, these deep ones are really occupying this huge volume uh, in this structure. And it's estimated that there are, you know, 600,000 to 1 million of them, right? So it's quite a lot of investment for barely detectable signal transformation. So this is where this flexible smelling idea comes from. I think this is important for understanding how these are contributing to uh, signal transformation. And this is something that I would like to um, explain in the next couple of slides. So why do, you, that, why do I think that flexible smelling is important for understanding the signal transformation fully? Well, the sensory systems in the brain are not existing in isolation. It's part of what we call sensory motor transformation, right? So as signal, sensory signals are processed more and more, it starts to kind of take characters more like a decision variable, and ultimately it starts to look more like, you know, behavior output or, you know, kind of resembling commands that you might send to your muscles, right? So there's some kind of transformation. So, um, and, and one thing that you might know from your own experience is that these things are quite dynamic. You know, you don't always do, right, respond to the same, in the same way to a given odor, right? And you, right, uh, you don't evaluate the odors in the same way all the time. So it's quite dynamic. And just to give you an example, uh, different ways of enjoying red wine, a glass of red wine. So you can, you know, enjoy it against something like cheese. It's a quite a nice way to enjoy red wine, I'm sure. But, um, you know, we have some idea, right, a categorical idea about what red wines smell like, right? So, um, so that's one way in which we smell red wines. 
Another way we can enjoy red wine is to really compare the subtle you know, variants, you know, for example, by pay paying attention to some fruitiness or you know, some spiciness in aromas emitted by the uh, red wines. So in other words, we do different things even for the same olfactory stimuli. Um, and this actually poses a challenge for the system. Why? Uh, it's because the optimal representation really depends then on the behavioral context. So if you want to categorize something, you know, if you want, you know, red wines, all of the different ones to kind of just smell like red wines, then you might want to uh, represent all these patterns more similarly to each other. Whereas when you're discriminating, right, you really want to accentuate this sort of pineapple odor or whatever. Um, and then uh, as a sensory system, you might want to represent these patterns uh, more separately. So, so in, in, you know, there isn't one solution fits all, really, that uh, suits all uh, behavioral context. So how does um, the olfactory system in the brain deal with this? Well, um, we don't know exactly yet, but one really attractive idea is that there are all sorts of other connections that can come back to the sensory system. So, you know, the behavioral context can influence how it is that the sensory system is processing um, the, uh, the sensory stimulus. Um, and so uh, one way is to have a feedback, right, that provides moment-to-moment -moment information about your behavioral context. And, um, you know, what's very unique about this structure, olfactory bulb, is that even though it's, a, it's located very peripherally, it is a recipient of quite a lot of uh, such contextual signal or feedback and other neuromodulatory inputs. So this could be key. And we can even visualize how these feedback fibers look like. So this is a study by Alison Boyd and others from Jeff Isaacson's lab, uh, where they injected this labeling agent. So this is an associated virus, so that neurons in this region of the brain can express fluorescent protein. And once these neurons express fluorescent protein, we can then follow their feedback fiber back into the olfactory bulb. And, and then if you were to then make a section here in the middle and to look where these fibers are, and you can see this middle part where the granule cells are located really light up. So somehow these deep, um, you know, interneuron granule cells uh, you know, it's, it's a major target of these feedback fibers. So potentially, uh, behavioral context is key to understanding how these are contributing to the signal transformation in the olfactory bulb. So this is something that we really wanted to get into. So then the first question we really wanted to ask was, you know, does it matter for, you know, does a moment to moment change in the behavioral context matter? Or olfactory processing in the olfactory bulb. And you know, up to that point, we knew that if you train the mouse on a task for a long time, then there are long-term changes. You know? So there's some kind of a memory related to um, the task. So you know, long-term things in olfactory bulb changed. But we didn't know whether moment to moment, the way that olfactory bulb processes information can be subject to behavioral context. So this is something that we wanted to understand. And so we used um, two uh, tasks, the so discrimination and generalization, that the two tasks are already introduced. And how do we do this uh, in a laboratory? Uh, so we generate olfactory stimuli. Uh, so we have this quite messy setup. Um, it's kind of uh, grown organically, so there are a lot of wires, but we are quite confident that we are generating quite good quality stimuli. And once we have generated the olfactory stimuli, we can use them to train mice on olfactory tasks and also study and perturb a neural activity while mice are performing uh, the olfactory task. So that's the idea. So 
um, what kind of olfactory stimuli do we uh, generate uh, for fine discrimination task? Well, we can mix uh, odors. So we generated for this particular um, study, we generated a binary mixture. So a mixture is containing two odorants. So ethyl butyrate that smells like pineapple and eugenol that smells like clove. We mixed it in different ratios. So uh, one mixture had more of ethyl butyrate, the second mixture had more of eugenol. And the task for the mice is then, then discriminate between these perceptually similar mixtures and associate this mixture with more ethyl butyrate with the reward um, and, and the second mixture with more eugenol and expect uh, no reward. So that's the fine discrimination task that we implemented. And the second task, you know, uh, so this is our implementation of the generalization. So either of the, you know, the isobutarid eugenol mixtures were the rewarded odors. And then the, the task of the mouse, uh, mice uh, was to discriminate against something entirely different, a mixture of methyl salicylate that uh, smells like wintergreen, a methyl tiglate that smells like ethereal rum, um, and expect no reward. So these are the two tasks. And the point is then to um, train mice to switch quite rapidly between this fine discrimination and the generalization task. And once we achieve that, what we can then ask is whether the, re the representation of this, uh, the same order, you know, depends on the behavioral context. And this we could do uh, using a two-photon microscope. Um, so, you know, we could then act, um, observe the activity of neurons in olfactory valve as mice behaved because we had, we had an optical window that allowed um, activities um, to be measured. So how did the result look like? So as I said, you know, um, odors are represented as maybe as a vector, right? So uh, by a number of neurons. So we can reduce um, the dimensionality uh, using conventional uh, technique like prin principal component analysis. So you know, you can think of this as activity pattern um, developing over time. Um, that's derived from the activity measured um, in olfactory bulb. And what you see is, you know, I'd like you to pay attention to these three colored trajectories. So these are all uh, corresponding to responses to the same order, but in different contexts. And what you can see is that responses when the uh, mice are doing this generalization task is uh, located, you know, uh, at a different location than um, um, when mice are performing the fine discrimination task. In other words, the context does change the way that response, uh, you know, neurons in the factory bulb respond to odors. So, um, and why should there be, you know, so where, where does this difference come from? Um, so we analyzed this and what we found, and, and so, you know, the analysis we did was to compare the amplitude of individual neurons responding to that mixture one in the generalization task and fine discrimination task. So if there is no change, then the responses lie along this diagonal. And I looked at, uh, so we, we looked at, sorry, um, uh, the responses uh, for cells that are selective for the second odor. So really particularly tuned for the unrewarded odor. And we saw there is really no difference uh, with the behavioral context. Uh, now, what we, when we looked at the cells selective for the first mixture, rewarded mixture, then what we saw was like, uh, you know, generally speaking, there was an enhancement in responses um, when mice were uh, doing this difficult discrimination. So there is some kind of an odor selective uh, modulation uh, by change, you know, uh, with uh, behavioral task. So what does this mean? It means that um, the task relevant features were somehow enhanced when mice were doing this difficult task. And we uh, confirm with the decoder analysis, for example, that this amounted to a, you know, making two similar representations a little bit more separable uh, from each other. 
So an attractive idea then, you know, something that we really want to test is whether this feedback is contributing, right, um, to a task selective modulation that depends on the behavioral context and whether this is coming via these deep located neuro interneurons. This is really the, you know, the next big step that we want to take. But we have a bit of a challenge. And the challenge is, as I have mentioned already, the output of the, neuro, you know, of the factory valve is carried by two types of neurons, right? So the superficial small ones and the mitral cells. And I have already said that the, the way that they um, transform signals is a little bit different. And it also turns out that the way that they're modulated by behavioral context is also different. And this poses a challenge when studying this because is because well, they're also, you know, uh, partnered with different um, populations of granule cells. So, you know, these deep interneurons that are located here, right? Some of them um, contact only the superficial ones. Some of them contact only the deep ones. But they're all intermixed together. So right now, it's really, uh, there's no uh, easy way to distinguish if you look at that. Uh, neurons here, which ones are contacting this type and which ones are contacting the deep ones. So it's all, you know, intricate, all mixed together. So we need a really a better tool. And this is something that we spent some time developing uh, with uh, Angelica Koldeva, who was actually an intern, but she, um, she had studied statistics before she came to OIST, and she's now a PhD student with Simone. Um, uh, and what she could do was look at you know, quite a large uh, data set that was publicly available, so single cell RNA-seq data. So this um, contains the gene expression patterns from single neurons, from many, many neurons from the olfactory bulb. And what she could then find was, you know, what is um, different about um, these neurons, molecularly speaking, uh, from these. And once uh, we could identify a mitral selective marker, what you can do is then uh, to generate a transgenic mouse strain. Mouse strain. So uh, ultimately, we can then label and manipulate these ones without manipulating these ones. We didn't have this tool before. And, uh, and this is what we did in collaboration with Satoru Takahashi's laboratory at Tsukuba University. And long story short, we're now able to um, selectively label these deep populations, uh, whereas before, um, you know, we, we couldn't differentiate these two types. And what this allows us to do, really, um, is to, for example, look at you know, these deep granule cells that only contact these deep lying, um, right, uh, uh, mitral cells and really study uh, what's special about them, especially when the behavioral context changes. So this is where really we want to go. We want to understand, you know, how it is that the behavioral context is getting into the olfactory uh, circuitry and uh, how it is that um, they're contributing to a flexible decision-making, flexible smelling. So uh, to summarize, um, I have uh, shared with you today that the, olf the olfactory system has, you know, quite a lot of specializations that allows them to deal with a large variety of volatile chemicals. And this information is analyzed in multiple stages involving, uh, you know, quite a lot of brain regions. And, but really to understand mechanistically, you know, to understand how this analysis is implemented in real neurons and their interactions, uh, inhibitory neurons are quite key. Uh, but, you know, to, to really reveal their potential, uh, we believe that behavioral context is quite important. And uh, I hope to make some uh, more advances. And uh, maybe next time I can share a little bit more. And, and with this, I'd like to thank all of my unit members uh, for their hard work and inspirations. But I would also like to um, thank all of the research support division uh, for their dedicated work in you know, animal resource section, imaging section, um, engineering section, and the basic lab support for really enabling our research.
Um, I'd like to thank my former supervisor, uh, postdoc supervisor Andres Schaefer and his colleagues at the Francis Crick Institute and the collaborators. And of course, I'd like to thank OIST and all of your support um, for uh, keeping me sane. So thank you.